this, uh, this is our fourth week in the series called Churchy Words. And uh, if you've not been here, I'll give you a brief explanation. Uh, you know, in church life, we kind of have errantly come up with our own language sometimes. Some of the words we use are obviously found in Scripture, but we even kind of even create other theological and doctrinal words that we assume everybody understands. And sometimes even inside the church, we just throw them around and really don't know exactly what we're talking about. And so we've just tried to pick out some of those words to, to kind of unpack some doctrinal ideas through, through this uh, nine-week series. And uh, today we're going to talk about a word that you might immediately think, oh, I know what that means, um, but I hope that the Lord will really clarify for us and, and help, uh, help us kind of apply some of this to our life. I want you to really just pray, even now, that you'll really approach the, the passage today from, uh, with two things in mind. One is my own spiritual condition, my own salvation. Just, just to make certain of that, because, uh, man, when you look at Romans chapter 8, which is where we're going to be, um, it's going to be really clear. I mean, it's going to be obvious what a saved person looks like and, and where they've come from and how, what they understand their salvation is. So, uh, so if, if you have any doubt about that, man, I, I really hope and pray that you will at the very least take a Connect card, put your name down and say, I want to talk to a pastor about, about this. Don't even have to say specifically, but, but go and turn that in in the back or in the offering plate or whatever, and that will give us, give us an opportunity to reach out to you. Because this is, man, this is essential. This is most important. But then secondly, if you are... Uh, you know, uh, a believer, and you're challenged sometimes, and you're tempted to kind of uh, condemn other people. Man, this is really, you know, we're all, uh, I guess, vulnerable in that area, but this is one that God really will, I think, give us some clarity on that, why we're not to go around being uh, condemning and uh, just have this, uh, uh, this idea like we're an assigned special agent of uh, condemnation in some way, which is so opposite of what uh, God's heart is. God has called us to be ministers of reconciliation and restoration. He's called us, according to Paul in, in Corinthians, he, he actually uh, has called us to bring people to Christ and the cross because Christ is what changes people. He's the one who can change people. Uh, and so we're not just going around zapping people with a condemnation gun. That's kind of, I think, the way that the, the culture thinks the church is sometimes. And, uh, and sometimes they have a, a legitimate reason to think that's what the church thinks, too, is that we are better than everybody else, and we're just going around, and we've got a license to point out everybody else's flaws. Um, both are wrong. We're, we're not going to a, a, a okay sin. We're not going to condone sin. But at the same time, we're not going to condemn other people because their sin is ultimately what will condemn them. That's what we're going to look at in, in Romans chapter 8 in just a moment. For a minute, I want you to imagine, though, uh, apple orchard, all right? I told you about a month ago or so that my family uh, went uh, up with the Lewises, and we went to the, the apple farm and, and, and picked some apples, and, and, and uh, it was undeniable that as you pick apples, you recognize just as many are on the ground as on the tree, right? In fact, some of the areas of the apples I like the best, uh, the apples, there are probably more apples on the ground than on the tree. They'd already been picked or they'd fallen off. Some of them probably from like my children climbing the trees and shaking and like 18 apples fall. That is not, I would not suggest that by the way. All right, that's not a good idea. But, uh, but, but that's, you know, apples fall to the ground. What happens when an apple falls to the ground is it dies. It actually begins a process of dying. In fact, if you go buy apples in a store and you take them home, put them in the refrigerator, those apples are dying. They're, they're actually in a process of rotting. That's pretty disgusting, right? Well, if you leave them long enough without eating them, they, they will rot. I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's an ongoing process that is set in place once the apples detach from the tree. It's common sense. We know that. That the source of life to the apple was cut off. There was no way that the life could continue to be given to the apple. And so the, the result, the consequence is that the apple dies. And... And here's the thing, there's no self-preservation. There's no process or mode in which the apple can somehow decide in and of itself and, and, and actually have the power to reconnect itself to the tree. That just can't happen. It would take a supernatural occurrence. It would actually take the creator of the tree and the apple to reunite them. It would take God actually reconnecting the stem of the apple to the tree and bringing life back to that apple. It would have to be something that is beyond nature. And in the same way, uh, this is applicable 
to Romans 8. As we look at this passage, I'm going to go and warn you, we're throwing ourselves in the deep end today. Romans 8, there's no shallow end in Romans 8. And so it's going to, I need you to stick with me. Every now and then I'm going to, go, I'm going to say, you there? And if y'all can just go, uh-huh, it'll be all right, let's practice. All right, you there? All right, that, so if you, I think just I'll make sure, because if I don't do that, I'm afraid you'll start glassing over in your eyes and you'll nod off and it'll be really difficult, all right? Uh, but, but this is so important, man. This is so important. We need to be faithful and, uh, and willing to hear the deep things. Uh, listen to John Piper's quote about Romans chapter 8. John Piper said, The essence of Christianity is that God is the supreme value in the universe, that we do not honor Him as supremely valuable, that we are therefore guilty of sin and under His omnipotent wrath, And he alone can rescue us from his own condemnation, which he has done through the death and resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ, for everyone who is in Christ. Knowing this, if what we promote is housing, jobs, health care, sobriety, family life, minus this message, we are not Christian. We are cruel. We comb man's hair in the electric chair and hide his freedom in our hands. Now, that is a strong quote, but, man, it's so true. Because here's what Piper's trying to say. Piper's trying to say that this system that we have been born into is a fallen system. We are the apple, all right? And we have fallen from the tree. And we are in a process of rotting. We are decaying away. Even spiritually, we've been separated from God by sin. And this separation has positioned us under condemnation. Now, what is condemnation? It literally is just like Piper said, and we'll read about it in Romans 8 in just a moment. It really is the wrath of God. And I'm, we hear that kind of stuff in our day, and some people just immediately start turning off the, the radio, man. They're like, what is he talking about, the wrath of God? It really is, the, the wrath of God is aimed at sin. It's not aimed at you or me, it's aimed at sin. And, and the, the, the response to a believer, to a person who believes, positions him in Christ. And this will we'll dive into this idea, but it positions him in Christ and protects him from the condemnation, the wrath of God that is poured out on mankind. So here's the deal. It matters where you're in, where you're at. Where you're are you positioned in Christ or are you positioned in the world? Are you positioned in the flesh? And so this is kind of what we'll unpack. Go and look at Romans 8 with me. Romans chapter 8, and beginning in verse 1. We're going to look at nine verses that are, I'm telling you, rich, rich verses. In verse 1 it says, Therefore, there is now no condemnation. Would you say, now, no condemnation with me? Now, no condemnation. Those are key words. There is now no condemnation. That, is, that should get our attention. It should make us lean in. Okay, who's he talking about? There's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit, who gives life, has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what is the law? For what the law was powerless to do, because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so He condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us. Now recognize, Jesus fully met this requirement. This was not a halfway met requirement. Jesus totally went all the way and completely met the need for our salvation. So he fully met, this. the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Notice in verse 4, it kind of transitions a little bit. It's not just talking about justification, the act of being in Christ. But then it's saying when you're in Christ, it changes things. It says those who live according to, not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Look at verse 5. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live according to the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. Verse 7, the mind governed by the flesh is hostile toward God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. 
Now, those verses are pretty simple, even though they're heavy. Uh, I mean, granted, they are some deep, uh, some deep issues, but we still can read that and pretty clearly understand what Paul is trying to say. Paul doesn't make it real confusing. Here's the bottom line. We've been delivered out of sin and death in order to live in Christ. We've been delivered out of sin and death in order to live in Christ. And there's no, either, there's no uh, both and, it's either or. We have to choose. I mean, it literally is like a, it is a choice that we are either going to position ourselves under the wrath of God in condemnation, or at salvation we come and we, we say, Christ, I, I need you to pick me up out of sin and shame and position me in you. And so the work of Christ at the cross actually allowed it, once we repent of our sin and self, we, we are positioned in Christ under the umbrella, that protective umbrella, so that the wrath of God may rain down on sin, but we are not found in sin, we are found in Christ. Now again, that is heavy, but that is so important for us to understand. Here's the question, who is condemned? We're going to simplify this, three simple questions. Who is condemned? Well, the passage is pretty simple, even though it turns it around a little bit. It says in verse 1, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So if we ask the question, who is condemned, it's simply those who are not in Christ Jesus. If you're not found in Christ Jesus, you are condemned. That's tough. But see, we live in a day that where it almost feels like people don't even want churches to tell the truth. And, and part of that is because churches, I think, have been guilty of being hateful with the truth. They've taken the truth of God and they beat people up with it and condemned them and been judgmental. And that's not the heart. The heart of God, we'll see in just a moment, is very clear that we're to bring people to the cross. But we can't bring people to the cross and, and lie to them about the gospel. We've got to tell them the truth. The truth is that when we live outside of Christ, then we are living in condemnation. We're positioning ourselves in condemnation. So we see a spiritual cause and effect here. A divine cause by Christ and a human effect. Those who are positioned in Christ are led by the Spirit of God. This free gift is received, but it's a covenantal response that's required from us. And so it's, it's this justification, sanctification. We talk about those words again, churchy words, a lot. But here's the deal. When we were placed, when we were positioned in Christ, we were justified. We were saved. But, but now the Spirit in us sanctifies us. He teaches us. He grows us every day. And so here's the deal. If we are not being sanctified, we were never justified. That is a theological fact. That is a biblical imperative. If there's not a growing process as a believer, if you, if you became a Christian, if you filled out a paper and you walked down an aisle and you were dunked in the pool, you know, and you went through the motions and you did everything everybody told you to do, but nothing ever changed. You didn't, you didn't find your relationship with Jesus go anywhere. Then listen, this is so important. There is no justification without sanctification. If, if you're not growing, if you didn't actually change, if there wasn't a transformation, then, then you, you weren't saved. I mean, that's a, that is a simple fact that we've got to be confronted with. And here's why we should be truthful about that. Because it doesn't matter if you're a member of the church. It matters if you know Jesus Christ as Savior. Yeah? It doesn't matter if, if you wear the right clothes and carry that. Yeah, look, it matters where you are going to spend eternity. That's all I care about right this minute, all right? And so in this whole issue of, oh, don't hurt their, don't hurt their feelings, man, who, who cares about feelings when you're talking about eternity? And so here's the deal. We need to make sure. That's why I said right at the beginning. We need to make sure, check our own selves to make sure that we truly are justified and sanctified. We're walking. Now, here's the deal. We need to make sure we understand this. It doesn't mean you're perfect. Doesn't mean you're, I'm not saying are you sinless, because nobody in this room is sinless. Every one of us mess up. Every one of us mess up. All of us fail. All of us fall short of God's glory. But here's what verse 14 says, that this is the test. Those who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. So the question is, if you're a child of God, are you led by the Spirit of God? I mean, there's several simple little questions I'm going to ask you. Are you being led by the Spirit of God? Is there evidence in your life? Can you point to things in your life? To where you're saying, yes, I am led by God's Spirit. I, I know, I'm following Jesus. And see, if you can say that, then praise God, 
there's evidence that you are a child of God. So the condemnation, the condemned, are not positioned in Christ. That's why they're condemned. So they're condemned by their location. They're actually condemned by not being in Christ. And, and they have not surrendered to the Spirit of Christ. So it's the work of Christ that justified the believer. But listen, it is, it is the work of the Spirit that sanctifies the believer. So it's an ongoing process uh, with God. We are possessions of Christ, and therefore we are positioned in Christ. So when He owns us, it says, Scripture tells us that we're bought with a price, right? Jesus paid the price for us. He, he bought us off of the slave market of sin and shame. And when he purchased us, we became his possessions. <laughs> but here's the beautiful thing, man. It's so beautiful about the gospel. Though, as we became possessions, we became positioned in him. And so he did not buy us. He didn't purchase us uh, for his um, glory alone, though that was part of it but definitely so that we could be positioned and protected under his beautiful arms of grace. That is a, a wonderful uh, reality. So here's the question that a lot of people want to say. Even, even people, I would think, that attend church every Sunday morning, all right? Well, preacher, Romans 8 says, there's therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. I've even heard people say this kind of thing when somebody's living in an ungodly lifestyle, maybe a lifestyle or a habit that they have that, that everybody would accept as sin, or maybe most, most Christians would accept as sin. Some people might would debate different issues. But here's what I say. People start trying to compromise, and they start pulling out proof texts. Well, here's one that people prove, pull out. And they'll try to say, well, hey, hey, there's no condemnation of those who are in Christ Jesus. And so you can't tell me I can't live this lifestyle. I've already been saved, right? So if I've been saved, you can't tell me that I can't do this because I'm not condemned anymore. It's almost like this, you know, it's like we have a, a, a grace card concept, right? It's, uh, it's like we pull out the grace card. Every time, uh, hey, don't, I don't even care if it's a sin or not, Shh, just swipe the card. It's kind of like Lexi's view of the bank account, amen? You know, it's just like, Daddy, I want some money. We ain't got no money. Just take your card out, Daddy, you know? It don't work that way, baby, you know? Uh, but, but that's kind of how Christians, some Christians just have this idea that, yeah, you just do whatever they want to because it's under grace. We're, under the, we're not under the law. We're under grace. That, listen, no offense, that is an uninformed, that's a kind word, that's an uninformed view of the gospel. That is not truth. We, we're not allowed to do whatever we want to just because Jesus died for us. That is, that is an irresponsible, unloving, I hesitate to say Christian, but that's an irresponsible, unloving Christian. But see, it's really difficult to say Christian there because a Christian doesn't walk by the flesh. A Christian, according to Scripture, walks in the Spirit. So are we excused to sin? Romans 6.15, Paul says this, Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? Certainly not. God forbid, your translation may say. Simply, no. <laughs> no, we, we don't have an excuse to sin. I do not have an excuse to sin. Though I've been saved, the vast majority of my life. It doesn't mean I can just go and live how I want to live. No, in fact, I'm more responsible. I'm accountable for this grace that God has given to me to live out loud for Jesus and not to hold back. So who is condemned? Listen, first, first question. Those who are not found in Christ are condemned. What causes their condemnation? Let's go to the second thing. What causes their condemnation? Uh, well, the, the, what causes the apple to rot? Right? That's the question. Well, when an apple falls from the tree, it begins the process of rotting. And so the apples have fallen from the tree. Listen, we have fallen from God. In the sense of when Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden, they sinned. When they sinned, we sinned. You may say, preacher, that is not true. I wasn't even born yet. There's no way you can't blame me for what Adam and Eve did in the Garden of Eden. Listen to what Romans chapter 5, verse 12 says. Therefore, just as sin entered into the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people because all sinned. So it's simply said like this. Listen, we are not sinners because we sin. We sin because we're sinners. See, some people would like to say, well, you know, I, I don't know at what point I became a sinner. You became a sinner the moment you were born. Now, 
obviously there's a lot of conversation to be had about at what point a child uh, is, is at the age of accountability, and so we're not going to get into all that. We don't, that, would be a, that would be a series in and of itself. But here's what I would say. There is no denying the fact from Scripture that when we're born into this human race, this human race has fallen. The human race has fallen, like the apple from the tree. And the process of human decay, spiritually, started. And so understand, we're born into Adam's family, and the family has fallen. Therefore... All mankind, all flesh is condemned until it is made alive in the Spirit of God. And so Ephesians 2, 1 kind of clarifies this even a little more. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, right? We were found dead in our sin in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world. Verse 5 says, but you've been made alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you've been saved. And so again, Paul trying to reinforce this whole idea. Pre-Jesus is death. (laughs) When you're positioned in Jesus, you found life. And so we are born into this world of sin and shame. We're born into this world of death and decay. But Christ positions us in his spirit. And we see that he brings life in the place of death. So God is not some cosmic killjoy who goes around condemning uh, everyone, all right? He's not going around. I think sometimes we get this idea that God is, God is uh, I've sometimes still got this George Burns picture of God, just because I know you ever see that movie, uh, but some old man up in, in heaven, and, and he's like just, you know, zapping people who make mistakes. That is not God. God is not, uh, you know, up there just trying to find fault in everyone, and he's just, and he's commissioned us as his agents of condemnation <laughs> to go around zapping everybody that gets out of line. You know, we're supposed to be spiritual police or something. That, and you may say, preacher, that's, so, that's a silly illustration. I, I, I don't know about you, but I, I know a lot of Christians that seem to think that's their job. That God has somehow commissioned them to condemn everybody. But I want you to say, if you'd say, well, I, I'd take issue with that. Let me, let me just kind of... Uh, give you Jesus' position on it, all right? John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. We know that verse by heart. Verse 17 says, God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world. God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. So the reason Jesus came <laughs> was to restore. The reason Jesus came was to reconcile. The reason Jesus came was to build a bridge to sinners. And I've just got to tell you, I'm thankful to God. Because if he had not, you and I would still be condemned today. We would be condemned. But thanks be to God, he came. Jesus came. He bled and he died on a cross. He built a bridge across this terrible pit of condemnation that we were born into. And he offered by his love and mercy, offered a way for me to come and to be positioned in Christ by his grace. This is so beautiful. And this is the grace that God has given us. So here's the question. If Jesus did not come to condemn, then why would the church condemn? If Jesus' purpose for coming was to call sinners to repentance, then how can we possibly think it's our responsibility not to do the same. I mean, God has called us not to condemn, not to push away, but to pull people to the cross, to pull people to the grace of God. And so we don't, we don't come at people with a spirit of condemnation. But again, this is balance again, because we want to make sure that people don't hear the extreme on the other end as our answer, because this is in our day, we live in, a, in an extreme day. It seems like nobody can have a balanced view and it's permeated the church of Jesus Christ. And it's really difficult. Listen, it's difficult for a church to be doctrinally pure today. Because there's so many extremes. And everybody wants to, to build a camp. Everybody wants to, to build a group and, and have a campaign and have an agenda, a doctrinal agenda, to go to one extreme or another. The extreme that we need to be is we need to be extremely faithful to the center of God's Word. That's what we need to be. We need to be focused on what truth is. Not what we want truth to be. You see, there's some who would be legalists who would go out and condemn everybody, right? I mean, a legalist would go out and try to find fault in everyone and ignoring their own fault. 
A liberal would go way over here and they would deny Scripture and they would deny truth and they would try to say, well, you know what? Uh, sin's a subjective thing. You know, you say it's sin, I don't. What's sin for you is sin for you. What's sin for me is sin for me. And just take the Scripture completely out of context and, and, and mutilate God's Word. That is, both extremes are absolutely deplorable. Both extremes are heresy, and we've got to reject them. And so we don't, we don't condemn, we don't go around telling people that, that uh, we're better than them, we're not going to be judgmental and condemning, but at the same time, we're not going to condone sin. We're not going to say that it's okay to just do anything, saved or lost. It's not okay to sin. Look, sin is, is, is terrible in the eyes of God. It, 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 in fact, listen, sin's what put Jesus on the cross. My sin... Your sin put Jesus on the cross. How could we look at sin lightheartedly? How can we look at sin like it's not a big deal? We, we can't. It's, it's irresponsible. It's unthinkable for a believer to look at it in that way. And, and so we, we've talked about who is condemned, what causes this condemnation. But the last question, how can those who are condemned find freedom? And that's, that's really the million-dollar question. I mean, how can we find Jesus? I mean, how can we... How can we find this grace? I mean, that, that's, that's the answer to everyone's problem. Verse 2 says, The law of the Spirit has made me free from the law of sin and death. So Jesus literally did make a way. And so in the Spirit, we live in the Spirit, not in the flesh. And so that, that ultimately, as a sanctification, we, we're responsible to continue living faithfully to God. But going back to this initial decision that's made, uh, look at uh, verse 3 again. Because we see, here's the key, look, it's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. And any message without Jesus is not the gospel. Any message without Jesus is not Christianity. And, and, and look at verse 3 and 4, just so clear. For what the law was powerless to do because it was, weak, it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be sin offering. And so he condemned sin and flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. Notice what he said. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own Son. What religion was not able to do, a relationship with Jesus was able to do. Look, Jesus conquered death, hell, and the grave. He made a way when we didn't have a way. And so to what extent have we been saved? To what extent have we been liberated from condemnation? Totally. As believers. Now again, there is therefore now no condemnation to who? Those who are in Christ Jesus. So we can celebrate. Man, we should celebrate that we've been liberated. I know sometimes you guys think that you know, I don't even know exactly what you think about me, but I, you know, I, I get a little excited. I don't know if y'all know that. I get a little excited sometimes, passionate. Some people will use different words, I guess. But here's what I say. The reason I can't understand anybody read Romans 8 and not get a little fired up. I'm serious. I, I'm, I mean, I would, I would not doubt your salvation if you didn't get excited about Romans 8, but I, I, would, I would at least think about doubting it. All right, I'm telling you. That's, it, is, it is hard to read. It is hard to read how lost we were and how saved we are and not get a little excited about knowing that Jesus has made a way for us when we were absolutely condemned and hopelessly lost without Him. It should stir our hearts if we're still connected to the tree, all right? This life-giving tree. We're not dead. We're not rotten. Aren't you glad that you're not dead? I mean, praise God. Look, we're not dead. We, we're not sitting on the ground for people to step on. We're not hopeless and lost. We have hope in Jesus Christ. And so there needs to be some, some recognition and understanding that Romans 8.1 is a reason to celebrate. It's a reason to celebrate. Look, there's therefore now no condemnation for you and you and you. There's no condemnation for you who are in Christ Jesus. Now, if you're not positioned in Christ, I'm not talking about you, all right? But if you're in Christ, there's no condemnation. No condemnation. He has wiped the slate clean, man. He has totally forgiven me of my sin. 
this is a big deal, all right? This, this affects my eternity, not just this, this short life that I'm going to live here on earth, but, but it radically changed my, the verdict, all right? I stood before the judge, and, 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 the, and the verdict was given, and, and it was not guilty, but it was not guilty because of Jesus, not because of me. Look, I was guilty in, in my sin and my shame, in the works and the deeds, in your works. You're born into sin, and so you were sinful, how many sins does it take to be a sin? We're sinners. And so as we were, we were tried, as we're going to be tried, judged one day at the end times, here's the deal. Look, that judgment is not going to be based on my works because of Jesus. As I stand there, I'm going to be found not guilty. And it's not going to be because I was the pastor of First Baptist Simpsonville. That will, that will not be why I'm found not guilty. I will be found not guilty because Jesus Christ came and he died on a cross for a sinner named Wayne Bray. That's why. That's the only reason why. It's not going to be because I have Sunday school pins down on my knees, all right? And I, got, I had perfect attendance at church. That's not why. That's not why I'm going to stand pure before a holy God. I'm going to stand pure before a holy God because Jesus died for me. And I said yes to him. I literally just turned from my sin. And I reached up a hand. He grabbed me and he pulled me up and he positioned me in Christ. See, that's what... That's what salvation is, and, and it really is a question today. It's not, it's not that difficult to understand. It is difficult to surrender. It is, it is hard to lay down your life. I'm not going to lie to you, and any preacher, teacher that would tell you otherwise would be telling you a lie. It's not easy. Here's what it takes. Everything. I mean, it, it's a question of are you willing to lay it down for Jesus? Are you willing to say... I'm yours. I mean, we sang the song, I'm yours. But I'm not talking about I'm just yours on Sunday. I'm talking about I'm yours. I'm talking about you are mine and I'm yours. I, I, I'm not going to just give you my, my religion. I want to give you my life. I want to give you my life. See, that's, that's what we were talking about last week with the salvation and lordship issue. And so, man, we need to check ourselves and make sure that we're not excusing sin in our life. Make sure that as a believer, we're not saying, well, I'm forgiven. I'll just go and ask God to forgive me and it'll be okay. God forbid. God forbid. Remember, your sin nailed Jesus to the cross. Your sin nailed Jesus to the cross. It's a big deal. And then also, man, we're not supposed to condone or compromise on sin. We're not going to look out at a lifestyle that, that God's word is clear on and say it's okay. That, that is not going to happen. We can't. We can't. But we're also not going to condemn those people. We're not going to condemn them or judge them because here's the deal they will ultimately be condemned by their sin. So we need to speak the truth of God in love. We need to love them to Jesus. We need to plead with them and beg with them to come to this, this place of grace, this, this place of restoration, this place of reconciliation that everyone in this room recognizes that we're not perfect. We're just saved by grace, and we want them to find the same grace. Somebody uh, once said evangelism is... Just one beggar telling another beggar where the bread is. Man, that's good stuff. That's good stuff. That, that's me. There ain't nothing about me that's not a beggar. I found Jesus. He had what I needed, and I, I begged him for it. That's how salvation works. So I'm in Christ, or either I'm under wrath. Only you and God know the answer to that. I'm just really going to ask you the question. This is it, the last question. If you were an apple... If you were an apple, would you be rotten? If you were an apple, are you still connected to the tree? If you're an apple, does your life show that you know him? Are you a child of God? Not are you a religious person. Do you know him? Are you confident in that? And I pray today you will... Make that decision. Number one, let me pray for you. Lord, we love you. God, I thank you for our church. I thank you for your word. And I do pray for confidence for some. I know that, uh, Lord, a uh, message like this could even, uh, it ought to really, to be honest, shake us all. And God, I pray that you would help us sift through uh, our own spiritual condition. Lord, if somebody's here and, and they don't know you, God, they've been playing a game. Maybe they've just been 
going through the motions. Lord, I, I pray you would speak to them. I pray you would also give great confidence to those who know you. Every one of the men and women, boys and girls in this room who know you and have confidence in their salvation, Lord, I pray you'd strengthen that. We want, to, we want to walk in victory. So, Lord, I pray you do that today. And then some who need to know you, maybe this is the first time they've ever been in this church in their life. God, I pray you'd bring them down this aisle. God, give them confidence and strength to make the decision you're calling them to. In Jesus' name. Let's stand together.